Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm, I'm Adam. No and I'm Norm. <laughs> We're on the wrong sides. <laughs> this the is order true. Is, We're in the, the order is inverted. We're on the wrong sides. The reason we are not in the cave today, and I know that uh, regular tested listeners love to be teased, the reason we're not it's in the, the main room favorite. is because the project I'm working on over there is so secret, we can't even tell you about it until like... Can't even be in the same building as so the project next summer. So you're announcing the announcement of the project yeah. next summer? <laughs> this is... I have, people love this. Uh, this is going to be great. I can't wait to read the comments on look, this one. <laughs> well, it's because it's a big franchise are, movie coming out next summer. Oh. You said too much already. Yeah. They're so good out there. You guys are so good at guessing. Look, uh, Madagascar 5 is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly over the hedge um, three hey so i want to talk about something that happened this week okay there's a lot of stuff that happened this yes, week adam it was a lot of week but most importantly a vr game came out called double tap no, no pistol, pistol whip. whip pistol whip <laughs> nailed it 10 out of 10 <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> No, I'm leaving that in. <laughs> yeah, oh, hell yeah, that you in. have to leave that what in. What is Double Tap? Is Double Tap a different game? No, I think that's just how you play it. Yeah, you, oh, do, yeah. you, you, no, you I double tap on the beat. I think it's a double tap. You oh, never, really? Well, well, there's a penalty for accuracy. Oh, is there? Yeah, your uh, score could be yeah, better. I don't care hey, about the if, score. If you're playing your John Wick simulator, <laughs> yeah. you got to play true to your feelings. It's yeah, one, one to the head, two to the chest. <laughs> or is it one to the chest, two to the head? I can't remember. I actually recently noticed how different... Okay, let's talk about this for just a second. Let's explain what the game is, yeah. Yes, Crystal Whip is a VR game that is really in a very similar vein to Super Hot. And Super Hot and Beat Saber. It is like this marriage between the two, and it's also like your John Wick running down a hallway, killing bad guys. It's a rhythm game. Rhythm. That you, the, the thing you have to do on the beat is shoot people yeah. in the body or the uh, head. I mean, it's optional. Um, and it, it is, um, it, not only is it thrilling, but I, I want to tell you, my thighs are on fire this <laughs> week. Yeah, I got Because out of the, there's so much squatting and jumping and moving and swaying. I got out of the car and was like, oh God, I'm, this is what it feels like to be 20 years older. <laughs> this is horrible. There's some really great uh, online memes. How old are you? 44. It's what it feels like to be eight years old. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, it's, it's, there's it's some great re- re- memes of memes? people who play Beat Saber ha- have like giant forearms, especially if you wear the weights. Yeah. yeah. And people were, you know, going to play Pistol Whip, we're going to have giant, giant I, calves. I told, I told Gina this morning, Pistol Whip is leg day. It is leg day. Yeah. It is leg day. I, and, and Beat Saber is arm day. So, yes. So... So uh, this was made by Cloudhead Games. They made a ton of stuff. They made the portal, um, the por- uh, Aperture, Aperture Science Hand Lab. Hand Lab. They um, made the gallery games. So they're early VR developers mm-hmm. who've been working for about six years in VR. And their first VR games were missed, basically VR it, missed like games. Puzzle games, yeah. Adventure puzzle games, which did okay. And they actually were the people who brought forth like snap turning in VR where you oh. use the thumbstick and yeah. you snap and turn and not do a smooth turn. That's comfortable. Th- they they yeah. figured that out. They, and they, they, they made it work. Yes. Okay. Well, they, they figured that lerps don't work. Uh, I mean, lerps work for 90% of people and really don't work for like 5%. Lerp is a linear ex- expression of, I can't remember what it stands for, but it basically means you jump and it doesn't blink out the movement. It just shows it in like six frames. Ah. Um, but, the, but the point is they're doing linear locomotion here in a way that makes no one I've put in this game sick. Um, most of the time when you move linearly, a certain, a larger percentage of people than than just stand still will feel motion sick after a really I, short period of time. And I am one of those. Is there a reason that it works? Because I found myself thinking it's because you're kind of always looking at the horizon, which is the advice they give you when you get seasick. So there's no acceleration. There's no linear oh, or there's, I'm always you're moving always moving the in the same, same direction. So you're, it's the same as being in a train that's moving at the same speed yeah. or a car or whatever. There's no um, horizon bob. There's no, they're really careful. Like the gun does a little bit of a, just a, the model just kind of bulges out a little yeah, bit on yeah. the beat. But other than that, there's nothing. And it also, I think those, I think those alternating st- uh, tiles on the ground also help because they give your brain more cues about the speed of movement. Um, it is an, a ludicrously pleasurable game to play. Um, I, I can't stop playing it. <laughs> yeah. Have you tried turning off the auto aim and stuff? I have not yet. I've oh. literally only just gotten through most of the levels on normal, uh, yeah. because yeah. going from easy to normal was surprisingly difficult. I, I, I can get through the very first one, I think on hard, but I maybe just get almost to the end and then die. And, and the thing that's interesting is I died with four seconds left on one of the levels. Very frustrating. The, well, the, so the levels, 
the thing that's neat is the levels, the basic, the kind of the tile set is the same with the difficulty levels, but they add different obstacles. They put the enemies, it's not just more enemies out of the same places. They're spawning them in different places. Yeah, you they're, can't count on it. They're, well, and they're giving you like, like on a normal, you're presented with maybe two or three guys, maybe four at most. On hard, it will spawn like a grid of four, two four by four grids or two two by two grids. And you have to just, you know, you have to John Wick that shit. Yeah. But and I, I think the reason you think it's fun is when I pitch it to you, it's like this fulfills a fantasy the same way Beat Saber fulfills a fantasy. Right. right. Beat Saber created using the rhythm music game as a template let you uh, give you a purpose, but let you really just play out the Jedi fantasy. And they did it in a really interesting way, which is they gave you points for accuracy, but they didn't necessarily make you suffer uh, 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 out of proportion for a lack of accuracy. Correct. Yeah. Like you get the bricks, you can make it through all the the whole level of Beat Saber, and it might not be pretty, but it'll be done. And, and you the feel the opening awesome. And, and the opening up of the aiming, mm -hmm. uh, so that close is good enough mm -hmm. is a fascinating way to make you more interested in getting better at aiming without having it be this too high of a threshold at the front yeah. end. Yeah. Um, I noticed my aiming accuracy is at about 75%. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Which feels that's pretty, pretty reasonable. Good. Yeah. Well, it's, so the, the scoring is interesting because the Beat Saber is a little esoteric. Right, Beat Saber. It's like about the arm, the motion of your arm, and the and the the length of your swing, and the speed, and the timing, and there's a bunch of stuff. I was that goes told in by there. a Beat Saber expert last week that um, a lot of people game it just by moving their wrists. So that, like real yeah. professional players aren't moving very much at all, despite the game's attempt to. The ones that are fun to watch are constantly <laughs> moving. Now. Yeah, no, me too. I, um, I move a lot. And so with this, you have um, 100 points for accuracy, 100 points for timing. And the closer you are to the beat, the more you get that little red circle above the guy when you shoot him. And then ah, okay. the accuracy is about uh, center mass. Center I mass see. or head, I think. Um, but if you hit a limb or a hand or something like that, it doesn't count. Well, I've been having so much fun with this game. Is there a boy we can play together networked? Can we can I we think know? we do leaderboards. We can see That's how good it. we are Just versus each scores. other. Wake up in the morning and seeing who has a better yeah. score amongst your friends is the Oh, most, okay. So yeah. we can we can compare our scores. Okay, then you have to teach me how to like figure we'll, out where we we'll guys are we will in the do virtual that. space. So, so I've done Can we go hang out in that beautiful postmodern loft I have? I wish. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I just want to spend more time in that space. Yeah. Um, the the uh, the thing that they don't have is I think cross platform leaderboards. So I've so far run down the Vive wireless battery I think three or four times playing it, uh, which is like an hour per session probably. Mm -hmm. It's a very good game. It's it's <laughs> it is. I am I am I'm thinking about it right now. I just want to go play. It may end up being the thing that causes me to attach a battery pack to the back of my headset or because you you're playing one on of Quest. those mods. Yeah. 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 I've noticed people, there's vests you can buy that'll slip a USB back behind your mm -hmm. shoulder blades. Well, so that's basically what the Vive Wireless is. It's like a big oh, okay. USB pack that I just put in my pocket and ah. it has a long enough cord. The, um, the, it's out everywhere, right? It's out on Rift, uh, Quest, It's just and not PSVR Vive. yet. Yeah, it'll come to PSVR. Mm. And then also the Beat Saber 360 pack is supposed to hit sometime between now and December. Um, so there is a brand new music pack for Beat Saber. Yeah, it's Rocket League sounds. Rocket League music is um, good. I don't Which know. I've, Monster I've, Cat. I played a couple of those that were really, really fun. Yeah. This is the interesting thing. Like, is EDM yours guys' music? I like EDM, but it's not something I listen to. It's and not I something I listen to casually. Me neither. Sometimes it I is, do. It is. It is Jamie Heineman's workout music. Really? Uh -huh. Yep. Jamie Heineman works out. Jamie. Jamie Heineman works out. Every goddamn day. And that's why he's going to outlive all of us. Wow. Jamie, Jamie, um, I don't know what his workout is these days. For a long time when we were on tour, it was kettlebells. Oh, um, I can see that. When, for a long time on Mythbusters, he, I just love this guy. He's so bizarre. He's like, well, I thought about how to exercise as many of my muscle groups as possible in the most efficient amount of time. And uh, so what I ended up doing was setting my treadmill to its steepest setting and then I carry 70 pounds uphill for 45 minutes. <laughs> what is it, like oh building God. the pyramids or something? Yes. That sounds horrible. <laughs> that sounds awful. But let me tell you, being somebody who has like built costumes for Jamie and painted him gold, he is a He's swarthy. He is completely, yeah. he is the literal definition of barrel chested. He yeah. earns the mustache. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. got to have a, to have that mustache like that, you have to have a physique. 
Yeah, I remember um, actually I see the same physical therapist that he sees because he introduced them to me and they're terrific. Uh, and one of the things that he was really impressed by was they taught him brand new ways of working out older muscle groups, oh. which involved less repetition and more like, because he had, he had, a, he had a tricky knee for a little while and it's really hard to work out knees. Yeah. It's really difficult. And if I remember correctly, and forgive me, medical medical listeners, if I if I Prepare get this to wrong, but your radio, uh, they what they had him do was go into a squat where he's, the knee is holding the tension, but he's not doing repetition. He's just holding it there uh -oh. until he can't, and he collapses into a mat that's below him, oh. and then take a little breather and do it again. And you you're basically it's this very low impact strength training, and he was blown away by how quickly and so. The, the reason I, I'm mentioning Jamie being surprised by someone teaching him a new thing is he's always researching efficiency uh, in ways to work out all the muscles. He really like, he wants to keep his body running for as long as possible, which is hilarious because when he gets sick, he gets really pissed. Oh yeah, it's right. like the like, weakness of the flesh. He can't, he can't, he can't, he can't handle yeah. the weakness of the flesh. <laughs> him, him maximizing the treadmill angle, carrying weight versus you doing a John Wick simulator in VR as your workout is it's, the quintessential difference between you yeah. two. <laughs> it's really. Um, but Jamie is somebody who, when he talks to like people who study uh, cognitive load and mental conditioning and stuff like that, I remember him 20 years ago saying, I come up with all my best ideas during my workout. So I mm. try to choose tedious, monotonous workouts that allow me to think about random shit. And yeah. Studies totally bear this out, There's, that exercise yeah. is a fantastic way to let your brain kind of free fly. Well, yeah. like, I mean, it's the same as doing tedious work in the shop where yeah. you don't have to think about it. You just have to do it over. Mowing is great. Yeah. Like yeah. just pushing that mower. Yeah. Flow a lot state. of time to think. Yeah. Getting in that flow state. Uh, speaking of Beat Saber, I'll do the tease now. There is a Beat Saber related one day build yes! coming in the near future. Did you future. film that? Yeah. Ooh. Oh yes, we did, and we did a we did yeah. I need, so can I come in and make a set of? We'll, we'll talk say. about it later. Yeah. Yes, you can. I all. figured. I I so yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah to yeah. be continued. You stay tuned. TBC. Yes. Pe two teases in one Speaking episode. Speaking of teasing and to be continued, can we talk about some shows that are currently airing on a weekly basis that I'm loving, like The Watchmen? Dude. Okay. So I'm only three episodes in. I haven't seen the fourth that aired last we night. Not. It, yeah. Uh, I will watch. We that could tonight. have told them it aired tomorrow, and they would have never known. Which is fine, <laughs> but I I'm so excited. The episode three. So let's Regina, set this up. We, we talked about it a little bit yeah. before. Regina King, of course, is the main star. It is a, a sequel to the book Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Not necessarily the T uh, the movie, although there are visual references mm -hmm. to the Zack no, Snyder. No, they went to they they movie. talk about the squid. So they're it, they're right, holding right. to the to, to the, the book, yeah, totally. not the film. And it's set in 2019, alternate reality where the world is different. You know, it's what happened if Nixon was president for Nixon that long. Nixon got four terms and, and then was followed up by an, an Ford, actor named no, R. R. Robert then, Redford. Right, yeah, Robert and then Redford, Robert Redford yeah. after Ford. And, but the world building of the show that they do is not just exposition that's laid out to you. You discover it as you watch the show. And oh. they and they, they, they actually go deep into uh, one of the center set pieces of the first three episodes that I've seen um, are the, the the Tulsa race riots. The mm -hmm. race, uh, race ma or the massacres. Mass yeah. The Tulsa massacre. Yeah, race riot. It's a massacre. It, uh, it, was a, it was a riot where the white people were upset that there was a prosperous black community and well, burned and it down it and killed the, a bunch of people. It was one of the most prosperous black communities yeah. in the United States. It was called Black Wall Street and it was an entire effective part of a city in which the, the local white people were so incensed about it. They not only showed up and murdered hundreds and hundreds of people, they were flying planes over and dropping bombs, fire bombs on the side. They, they raised an entire town, R-A-Z-E-D. Um, it's a horrifying part of American history because it happened in the 20s. Yeah. They never, they don't, it's funny, growing up in the South, it's something they don't teach you. Shocking. You never hear about that. Um, and they, 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 uh, Tulsa has reparations. In the show, one of the things that happens is that Tulsa confronted itself and applied reparations. Um, and it's not a simple matter. It's a complex social thing that goes on. And that also weaves into the first three episodes in a way I found really fascinating. One of the really fascinating meta things about this show is an HBO show. And much like the way HBO's producers are making Westworld and, and Watchmen and even True Detective, it's week by week release. They are well aware of kind of the online 
online following and even the, us discussing this, right? And how a show in the community that follows a show builds a life of its own that the creators can't really anticipate. So they prepare a lot of ancillary material, which is perfect for a show like Watchmen because that's exactly how that story was laid out. When it was first put out, most people know it as a graphic novel, but it really was 12 issues in a maxi series that was released, you know, one month at a time. And with each issue, there would be excerpts from the original uh, Night Owl's memoir. Yep. There would be these newspaper clippings. That, and, and that stuff's in the Absolute Edition is the kind of interstitials, and, right? And also the Black Freighter. And so yeah. that kind of extra bonus material Black, that helps yep. tell the world, they're doing that now with this show. Not only in this like Pedopedia thing, Pedopedia, uh, P- uh, yeah. and also the podcast that Damian Lindelof is doing. I, the- I, I've got to listen to that. I have to say, Dam- this is, so there's been th- four episodes. The fourth is uh, just recently aired. I've seen the first three. The third episode, the first two are great. I enjoyed them immensely. I burned through them. The third one is amazing. And it's amazing. So uh, it, it walks through uh, one of the original Watchmen. Yeah, it's the first episode in the season where Angela Abar, Regina King's character, is you're not seeing the world through her eyes. It mm-hmm. brings in a new character to the show, which ends up being revealed to be one of the original Watchmen. It's it's Laurie Laurie Laurie. Well, she, she changes her name to Laurie she's, Blake, but it's Silk Spectre Blake, too. She's, right, right. She's right. comedian and Silk Spectre one's daughter. Yes, and. Jean Smart plays her, and she is appropriately aged, and she's an FBI agent. Jean Smart has so much fun with this character, and you can imagine what you know about what it's like to be a woman in Hollywood, a woman of a certain age. Don't often get roles that are meaty like this, and you watch the actress just make so much delicious hay out of the role. But like that, that, the cold open, I, I think it was the cold open, when they're in the bank, Mm-hmm. Where she's going yeah. into the bank and uh-huh. and uh-huh. like they're 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 doing a faux. I mean, I it's last week's episode. I don't know if we want to do spoilers. We can do or light, not. light spoilers. It's, it just happens in the first three minutes. She's it's basically a sting to catch a vigilante. Yeah, and it turns and there's so much glee and she gives so few fucks about anything uh, that the vigilante cares about. Like to me, the the thing so, that's interesting about this is it's all about the impact of. Let me tell you this. Costumed yes, vigilantes yes. It's in the world. why people wear masks. I think Tim right. have says he's interested and he thought the original Watchmen graphic novel was about a study of why would ordinary people, because the only one with superpowers is Dr. Manhattan, right. why would ordinary people put on masks? And there's a monologue in episode four, which you guys will see, where it, it, the thesis is right out there. Right. She's spoken. Okay. Lori says what her theory and why people wear masks. So and as a former mask wearer. As right a self. former mask yes. wearer. And that first opening scene where you see her in that bank is clearly for me a uh, quoting uh, showing the dark knight opening bank heist yep, sequence yep, yep. right where and except she's the joker mm-hmm. right and, and daughter so of the comedian there's this other oh, that's really nifty there's yeah. this other as oh, it's beautiful there's this other aspect of that episode which is dr manhattan's living on mars no one has seen him in a fair bit of time um but because of his omnipotence there's apparently phone booths you can go to and you can call mars and talk to him it's a which is the best industry, scam it's the best scam because you, you don't have to call he sees no, the entire it's, universe exactly. at the same letters time letters to santa letters to santa but there is gene smart in one of those phone booths and she is telling him she's telling him a joke and she screws it up and she starts telling him another joke and then that ends up becoming again light spoilers oh, so good. That ends up becoming the anchor. Her phone call to Dr. Manhattan becomes the anchor of the episode. What's the framework for the whole episode? And it is a framework that feels so Alan Moore with the the the, the black the black freighter. The black freighter, the black freighter yeah. um, which is such a weird, dark thing in that issue. Mm-hmm. Well, right. Uh, well, but but the, I mean, it isn't actually like like she doesn't she the, she doesn't mess up the joke. It's all intentional. No, I get that. It's, it's all part and parcel. And, a, and it's also, that's a classic joke construct. Right. Well, where you, f- you fake mess something up and then you call it back. It's so good. And but yeah. she's fucking with with John's imp- omnipotence too, presumably. Like, right. does he see the, he sees the entire joke at the same time. He right. knows that there's no joke. She knows that there's no point to telling him the joke. And she does it anyway, purely for her own edification. And, and because she wants to fuck with John. And there's this point in the joke, I guess, at, at about the, the 70% mark of the joke where she says, and now the last hero steps up and God cracks his knuckles. <laughs> and again, she, 
it was, my wife was walking by while I was watching this. She hasn't jumped into Watchmen with me yet, but she looked and she went, oh, uh, uh, Jean Smart. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And she was like, how's she doing? And I'm like, oh man, she's yeah. really bringing every, all the crap. There's nothing left on the table. No. And it's so delightful to watch. She was you a, even can sense that she's having a great time despite the lack of fucks the character gives. And oh, her, yeah. her like verbal sparring with Regina King in the episode also the, stunning, and Regina King is amazing in there. They only have that one they, scene, neither, right? Neither, no, two scenes. Two scenes. Neither back down. Not at all. Oh yeah, not yeah. even a little bit. Yeah. Well, and we haven't talked about Jeremy Irons yet. So here's the interesting about Jeremy <laughs> Irons. So okay, uh, and there's a lot there too. Part of this was <laughs> laid out <laughs> in the podcast uh, that Dame Lindelof and Craig made. Uh, they released. Too. They released the podcast after the third episode, yes, right? Once every three yeah. episodes. And one of the things they revealed is they filmed all of Jeremy Irons' episodes first. Mm-hmm. So they didn't film things currently. They had him, his availability, and their shooting location in, in, I believe, Ireland for a set time. And they just shot all of that before the scripts were even written for the other episodes. Wow. Wow. Which is also kind of a very Watchmen thing to do because they're doing non-linearly. Well, it's like the Black Freighter. Yeah. Like it's an interspersed stories. But he's having a lot of fun. Before we continue on with this week's episode, I want to let you know that Still Entitled This Week is made possible with support from Afternoon Cyber Tea. For companies, governments, and even individuals, managing the ever-evolving cyber threat landscape can be the difference between thriving and being thwarted. Afternoon Cyber Tea with Ann Johnson has insights for CISOs and key decision makers striving to succeed amid rapid change without compromising security. Each week, Ann Johnson, Corporate Vice President for Cybersecurity Solutions at Microsoft, talks with cybersecurity thought leaders and influential industry experts to explore perspectives on implementing new tech, next generation security risks, current trends, and the future state of cybersecurity. Join Ann as she and her guests explore the risks and promise of tools and systems powered by AI, IoT, machine learning, and other emerging technologies, as well as the impact on how humans work, communicate, consume information and live in this era of digital transformation. Because it's not enough to keep up with cyber criminals, you need to stay a step ahead. Afternoon Cyber Tea is available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. Listen in to lead the future of cybersecurity. Now back to the show. Okay. So speaking of Dr. Manhattan, yeah, I want to talk about The Morning Show with Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because- And Steve Carell. And Steve Carell, but also Billy Crudup, who plays Dr. Manhattan in the Watchmen film. Oh, I didn't know he was in that. I haven't watched it yet. Not only is Billy Crudup in it, but in a, in a roster of terrific actors, Mark Duplass, Steve Carell, Jennifer Aniston, uh, Reese Witherspoon, Billy Crudup is like, he's in almost in a different show. And it's so much fun to watch him go. He is, Billy Crudup has played some great villains over yeah. the years. In this specific role, he is leaning out over his villainy with a glee that is sheer delight to watch. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. Like, uh, the, he's amazing. The reviews for this show are bad. They and Or kind of all over, but I mostly will, bad. I will say, um, I think, uh, I'll just say uh, up front, I think Jennifer Aniston is like one of the great physical comedians of television. Green. She has phenomenal timing. Um, and she's playing, uh, she's, playing a terrific part. Uh, and Reese Witherspoon also, I'm a big fan and sh- her part is great and meaty. I find the writing quite uneven on the show. So some mm. scenes will be really electric and sparky and fun and weird. And then the next scene will be like some bit of boilerplate where someone's like, did you get the plans? Yeah, I got the plans, boss. We'll get them soon. Not that that a dialogue exchange right. occurs within the show, but it feels that well, clunky sometimes. I mean, that that so the framework is it's a show about a morning show um, where the co-host of long, uh, uh, the Matt Lauer character yeah. Is, is played by Steve Carell. Played by Steve Carell has a scandal of some kind and is from the headline. The show. Well, he sexually yeah. harasses oh, okay. he has sexual impropriety at the workplace, okay. and he is, sleeps with many people that he works so, that work for him. So, like, if we think about the list of shows that are the framework of the show within the show, we have like Larry Sanders and Gary Shandling. We have mm-hmm. Newsroom. We have Studio Sixty. Like, we have Thirty Rock. Where does this land on the on like? Um, like, well, from what you've seen, like, it, is it, it, cause it's a drama, right? Yeah. It feels as a drama, it feels more akin to like the good wife, like that okay. kind of ensemble drama of good actors. And occasionally the dialogue can be 
stupid turgid. Okay. Um, Mark Duplass, by the way, an actor, the Duplass brothers are two actors, the founders of Mumblecore, uh, and yeah. they've been in many, many different things, including the uh, 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 a whole bunch of television you've seen. Mark Duplass is terrific in this, playing this tired director. The, the supporting cast is terrific. Uh, I like it more than I don't like it. Okay. I, I admit that a bunch of scenes feel weirdly out of place, and I can only imagine what it's like to bring in two giants like Aniston and Reese Witherspoon yeah. and try and direct them in some... I, well, I mean, Steve Carell at one yeah, point every, was the biggest comedy star in the world. Right, every, and everyone's great. Yeah. Steve Carell, actually, in the first episode, when you first finally cut to Steve Carell's minor spoiler... They're like, he's in his house and doing crisis management, right? Because his job's just ended. And he yells, for forever men have used their power to get women. And now I'm getting punished. Wow. <laughs> and it's it's There's a delight to the fact that he's so unabashedly shitty. He's totally admitting it up front. Like there's no, I don't want to be that kind of person. No, he's exactly who he wants to be. Wow. I, I so I'm like, I'm always interested when they cast comedians for drama roles because it's usually there's usually it's usually to good purpose and it usually works really well in that vein in the second episode there's a scene in which so Carell is they're, they're very slow to bring him to wheel him into the plot he, you're just kind of dipping in him a couple times per episode and then late in the second episode he meets with a Hollywood director whose career was also derailed by uh, sexual impropriety played by Martin Short <laughs> oh Christ and Martin Short not only looks great, but to your point, these two world-class comedians playing drama, yeah. the, the amount of weight and timing and stakes they're adding to their dialogue is like a master class. Yeah. And there's a turn in the scene and the turn, I'm getting chills just thinking about it, the turn in the scene that both of them, it's like... <sighs> Because they're comedians, they have explored within an art form that has immediate stakes. People laugh or they don't laugh, uh, depending on how good you served the joke. And those stakes, I think, make comedians truly great actors because they understand within the narrative arc of a set of lines where the turn is, where the punch is, where your emotional arc's going to be. And watching the two of them talk is chill. Well, it's a difference, like the difference in cadence between a huge audience laugh and a huge audience groan, right? Same word, same deliver, same timing even. Right, right. And just like the tone of the voice can turn. And like, just to be clear, Reese Witherspoon has done some incredible dramatic roles. Totally. Like Pretty Little Lies. Lies? Yep. The thing on HBO. Yep. yep. Is, is spectacular. I haven't watched it, but it's, yes. It's really, really good. I, my wife loves it. Um, uh, Jennifer Aniston was in that Good Girl. What was it? The movie? Yeah, that was, that was, was a Good Girl. Ago. It was a long time ago, yeah. but it was intense. And like, I thought that was a phenomenal film. There's one thing that I find about Aniston that um, is that it seems difficult for her to play an unabashedly shitty person. Mm. And I feel sometimes like that's what this role requires. Did and you feel bosses? <laughs> oh, yes. That is actually your brilliant. That's my favorite Jennifer Aniston she's, role. She's I think a, she's incredible in that. But she's playing a comedy shitty person. Well, she's playing an, a, a ludicrously over the top shitty person right. and flipping the Character flipping the, the yeah it, there's the degree of how much fun she has in horrible bosses is super great yeah like i love that that might be my favorite movie role she's of hers. charlie day's boss yeah <laughs> which is oh fitting. my god it's so yeah. horrifying I mean, the scenes are coming i have back ptsd tonight. from that film from her it's, and it's like, yeah i like she well she's yeah she's playing steve carell in morning show <laughs> in horrible bosses um sorry but you get to like i said the show is uneven i totally granted that I find myself, I find the episodes go very quickly, I, which is, is it to an me hour? a marker. Yeah, it's an hour, okay. which it's to me a marker that it's really good, that huh. it's enjoyable, mm. right? If it's like, I'm not feeling like anyone's wasting my time. Yeah. There's only one more thing I want to say about Watchmen before yep. we move on, is that when you guys watch the fourth episode, it does introduce a new character that you yep. haven't seen before. I'm not going to spoil Ooh. her details, but the actress who plays her may look familiar. She hasn't been in a lot of stuff, but you appreciate it. She plays... The woman in uh, the Matt Damon downsizing movie. Oh, the, Vietnamese, the Korean, the Vietnamese woman. The Vietnamese woman. Excuse me. Yes, she's 
so the that movie is called Downsizing. Downsizing. Yeah. And it's and an Andrew was, Payne film. Yes. And we talked about it on the podcast. Her right. performance is incredible. Really, Her performance yeah. is incredible in that. She is the best thing in that movie. And Matt Damon's great in it. And it took me like a little bit of watching the episode of Watchmen. Like, why have I why is she oh. so familiar? And she is a completely different character in here, but just as good. So huh. there's a film festival I want to do. Okay. And maybe I've talked about this on the Can podcast. we do this one with the Kurt? Uh, Carl Urban. One weekend. The Carl, Urban, was the Carl Urban, Urban. There's the Let's Fuck With Bill Pullman's Mind film festival suggested by John Hodgman. That one's really good. Right? Yeah, I'd, yeah. Watch that. I'd yeah. go to that. Um, this is movies that the studio marketing department had no idea how to release. Oh. And Downsizing is one in which the movie that it was was not the movie they were advertising. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I think so. Uh, Free Fire is another Blade one. Blade Runner. But yeah. <laughs> He's got three days. Did you see the thing that was with the studio notes from an early screening of Blade Runner? Like no. after Ridley Scott's second try at cutting it to so the studio would say okay? Yeah, that's the rough compromise cut with the, Van, not the Vangelis. It doesn't have Vangelis. Yeah, it's all the scratch track. Yeah, it, I've seen and that. It has, uh -huh. oh, you, yeah, and it has, yeah, and they're like. That was this, released at the Castro in 93. <gasps> yeah, I saw it in the theater. So, so it's like this, the, like the notes are, this is, this, this narration is terrible. The, you know, the voiceover is terrible. <laughs> Where's the Vangelis? The Vangelis was the only thing that made the first hour tolerable. <laughs> there's too, there's not enough fighting and then there's too much fighting. And it's, uh, I'll, I'll send you the Twitter. Right, I'll, right. send it, I'll send it to you so you can put it in the notes. Um, it was good. I'm super psyched for the fourth episode of Watchmen. Like I said, I'm going to watch it in just a couple of hours when I get home. And then listen yeah. to that podcast. Highly recommended. Damon Lindelof, Craig Mazin from- uh, From who, Chernobyl. Who wrote Ch Chernobyl yeah. and uh, Script Notes podcast. But um, very, the, very good. Watchmen is doing a wonderful job. I, look, I was complaining last year about TV shows like Westworld where I'd finish a whole season and I felt like I watched 10 or 12 hours of 10 or 12 hours of television. I felt like I watched four. Well, it's like plot. Right. You're just getting plot. Uh, Watchmen does not feel like that. Uh, the Boys did not feel like that. I felt like I got big fat episodes every episode of The Boys and I'm feeling the same thing with well, Watchmen. Well, Watchmen's, they're, they're 45 minute episodes or something. About an hour, an hour long, nine of them. They feel, they feel like each one feels like a movie almost. Like they, not in the, not in that there's like uh, opening and closure of, yeah. of yeah. Blotten and the, and but the it's storyline. it's super cinematic. It's, it's gorgeous. Every, every how, minute is it's crafted. How and, amazing is Don Johnson too for 70 something years old? 74? I, I hope this is like John Johnson's Travolta moment where he's suddenly going to get cast as like the, the in all sorts of, old guy who's in a bunch well, of other we, stuff. We lost Robert Forrester sadly and yeah. someone's got to take up that mantle yeah. man. Yeah, exactly. Do you know by the way um, uh, uh, I, I just learned that I'm older than Wilford Brimley was when he oh, made Oh, you passed cocoon. the cocoon line. I passed the did Wilford you, did they Brimley tweet line. The, you, I passed it a did, year and a half ago. Oh, did you, oh. Yeah, it's like he Jennifer was 51. Jennifer passed it now. He was only six years older than you are now. Fuck right off. <laughs> That is, wow. Yeah. Wilford Brimley came out of the womb with a mustache and a 55-year-old guy's hey, face. Yeah, he didn't have it in the thing. <laughs> he didn't have the mustache in the thing, did he? Yeah. Well, I don't want to be out here no more. <laughs> they won't. Well, I don't want to be out here no more. Know. How come I can't come back? <laughs> <laughs> um, we were going to talk about so many other things. What else we were we going to talk we, about? We're, we're, we might be at our time. Okay. But we want to... We'll save those topics. We did have a great suggestion online, though, and we'd love to keep oh, on getting yeah, those suggestions. Oh, yeah, San Francisco recommendations. Yes, because uh, it is get, getting closer to the holiday season. Don't move season. to San Francisco. We're full. We, well, we, we, I'm <laughs> saying for, for the holiday season, a lot of people maybe vacation to San oh, Francisco. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, and we, we tour some dollars. Very welcome, frequently, yeah. we get questions asked of us of what are the things to do and see when you have about oh. two to three days. Uh, I, you know what? I can do a two-minute little quick rundown of a couple things that, that are real that, highlights. And then we'll expand okay. it okay. next week. My highlights are... In advance, got to book your tickets, go to Alcatraz. As advertised, it is one of the best half days you can spend visiting a historical do, do, site. And do the audio tour. Do Okay. Yeah, put, buy, pay the money for the audio tour because it's narrated by former guards and inmates. They they recorded them while they were still alive. Amazing. And they like tell the stories of, it's a, the oral history of what it was like to be there, what it was like to be in the cafeteria, what it was like, to, you know, where the scary places were, where the not scary places yeah. were. It's really good. If you want to see things um, that the locals even don't often see, um, I recommend looking for a nearby secret staircase. San Francisco is full with its hills. It's full of secret staircases all over the city. Uh, if you just Google
Google San Francisco stare, staircases. You can find them. The Lion Street steps. The Moraga stairs are great. Yep. They're, 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 um, and they're. each one is a little bit of an adventure. Mm -hmm. Like there's wonderful things you can see. You usually have great views. Um, and then I want to give a shout out to my one of my favorite restaurants here in the Mission is a local eatery that's been there, I think, for more than four decades. Panchitas. Mm. Uh, Salvadorian pupusas, which is a Salvadorian kind of quesadilla with meat and other stuff inside as well as cheese. You eat it with a coleslaw and a hot sauce. And um, here on Tested, we eat there probably once a week. In fact, I've catered New Year's parties We've, with yeah, their I've, had, I've eaten there a lot with you. It's very yeah, good. Yeah, uh, and it's wonderful. Down home, this is what the mission has always felt like to me. Uh, Panchitas used to have a Panchitas 2 and a Panchitas 3. Those two paired back, but now they have a new Panchitas on Valencia Street around the corner from their old place. Um, and if you're visiting San Francisco and you go into the one on 16th and it's packed, walk around the corner to the other one. It's probably not as packed. Oh. Uh, and they both have the same great food. So those are my quick San Francisco shout outs, but I can build up some more. And let's, we'll do that as a full episode. Cal Academy. Go to Cal Academy. Dude, completely. Yeah. Museums. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't stay in Union Square. Don't stay. Yeah, no. Now. Don't do you know, I I saw when last time we were at Weta Workshop, one of the Weta folks went, Oh, I went to San Francisco and I stayed in this hotel. It was on Polk Street. And I walked the whole of Polk Street and it was just awful. And I was like, You literally walked, I think, the worst street in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> you walked the it's like the Gina Gina used to do a walking tour when people would come to town where we would start at Union Square, start at the Pop Powell Street Bart Station, yeah. and then walk up because you walk through Union Square on the way, but walk through Chinatown and North Beach. And then go to the Alcatraz Ferry, which was still on Fisherman's Wharf. Right. And it was like you you start at like nine o'clock in the morning, you hit the ferry for a one o'clock ferry, grab lunch and a beer somewhere along the way, and then spend the afternoon at Alcatraz and come back and go have dinner someplace. And it was a fantastic way to spend the day. Yeah. It's a really, really walkable city. Um get them you can get the the get your clipper card so you can ride Bart and the and the and the Muni uh, and the cable cars and the street cars and the whole thing and and yeah. Bring your walk-in shoes. I think that when we do this episode, let's do some of our memories of doing those things. Yeah. Uh, of the things that we're recommending, because I think there's some good stories in there for the locals. Twin yeah. Peaks, everyone should go to the top. of. I go to Twin Peaks actually probably once a month. If it's cloudy, don't go to the top of Twin Peaks. You get to embrace the fog. I, I don't mind. You don't it. see I, anything. I, I still don't mind it up there, but you're right. You're right. Yeah. When, if you're going when, for when the you view. can see the city, it is one of the more remarkable views what? of any city ever, except for the view of Cape Town from Table Mountain. I, I, and yeah. the two feel not dissimilar, although Table Mountain's a, a bit more majestic. The first time I was in Hawaii, I was, when I was there, I was like, oh, it's a cloudy, it's an overcast day. Let's go to the top of the volcano today and see what it's like up there. So we drove three hours up to the side of the volcano <laughs> and got to the top. And I was like, oh, right. This is why this is a bad time to do this. It's 40 degrees. And this is what uh, the inside of a cloud yeah, feels the like. The dumb shit we do on vacations. Yeah. I ran out of gas in a Prius in front of the Dole Plantation how on Hawaii. Do you, how, do you, how do you run out of gas in well, a Prius? Well, there's so much, there's, you get so many miles out of a tank. I just yeah, forgot fair. that you had to stop and fill it. Well, like the car was, ran on bananas. But, and a, when you're thinking in your head, <laughs> That sounds pretty stupid. Let me tell you that my wife was saying that to me directly. There was a, <laughs> look, just to be clear, there was a 2003 Wired article, I'm sure, about the people who get such good gas mileage in their Prius that they forget to put gas in it and thus <laughs> run out of gas in their Prius. Indeed. All right. What's uh, coming up on the site this week? Well, Mark? we have that build that I alluded to. It will be all re will be revealed. I also want to visit the studio of a pop-up book designer, and that video will be up later this week, uh, as well as just- Does that mean he things. randomly designs books in new locations all the time, or uh, he designs pop-up no, books? He designs pop-up books. Okay, books. cool. Yeah, just check. Either one's fine. Paper engineer. <laughs> yeah, either you could be cool. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the model in front of me is um, a model kit that Kate and I put together, and we did some fun the painting lighting and lighting so of it, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Star Destroyer. Those little lights so aren't a twinkling, out. Norm. This doesn't work. I, it, it's a speaker. Oh, oh Adam, that's Adam, what I want. I want a speaker, a speaker that looks like a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> uh, the middle cube is bigger than the others. Look, it's best not to think about it too okay, much. Okay, I'm just going <laughs> to let it go. On, on this week's episode of Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod, we talked about Wi-Fi. Yeah. All the whole history, how why Wi-Fi is important and like... Can you, can you remember Lamar's, the time without Hedy Wi-Fi? Lamar's, uh, Hedy Lamar's contribution. Oh no, it's her contribution is to Bluetooth. Bluetooth, yeah. Uh, we talked about uh, we talked about the Shannon limit, which is the theoretical maximum data capacity for a frequency range, ah, which was ooh. really fun. There's math. Uh, you can find it at content, uh, techpod.content.town. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And you can find us always on tested.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Hi, mom. Bye, mom. <laughs>